In this video, I'm going to show you how to brain tan a rabbit hide, starting with a fresh raw pelt that just came off of a rabbit. I'm also going to show you how to freeze it for later so you don't have to tan the hide at the same time that you're processing your meat. Plus my favorite pickling solution to make the scraping process so easy you don't even need to scrape your hides. Then I'll show you how to extract the brain from the rabbit's skull. And along the way, I'll talk about where I got my rabbits, where you can get yours, how much it costs to tan the pelt, which I'll tell you right now, it's only a dollar. And I'll give you the full nerdy breakdown of how much it costs to feed a colony for the year. I raise American chinchilla rabbits for their meat and for their pelts. I like this rabbit for the pelts because they're very consistent. You're gonna get a nice gray color on top and a little white on the bottom. I am tanning these pelts so I can turn them into a big king size blanket for my bedroom. We have all of our animals just a few feet away from our bedroom and you can actually see the animals from all four bedrooms plus the kitchen, dining room, and living room. That makes it way easier to watch out for predators. Where I'm going with this is we always keep our bedroom window open so that way we can listen for them and if there is something around we can act really quickly. And since it's winter, like nine months out of the year, it gets pretty cold in our bedroom, so having a really thick quilt like this will be so nice. I typically only butcher one or two rabbits at a time because usually I'm doing this while my husband is at work and while I'm watching our three and five year old. So one or two at a time is much more ideal, plus it gives us a lot more fridge and freezer space, which we are lacking right now. I really need to get another freezer. I butcher my rabbits. I will take the pelts, roll it up with the hair in and the flesh out, and then put that in a plastic bag or a mason jar or something, and then put it in the freezer. I say to put the skin fleshy side out so that way it freezes faster, so that way you're not gonna have like any mold or nastiness in there. The hair isn't gonna go bad, but the skin is more likely to if your freezer takes a while to freeze things. Once you have about six pelts saved up, you can go through and start the tanning process. I use one cup of common alum. This is food grade, so it's fine to put your hands in it. I also use one cup of salt. You want to use a non-iodized salt like sea salt, kosher, black salt, Himalayan, or pink salt. Sometimes you can do like gray or smoky or flaky, but usually the sea salt or the kosher is gonna be the cheapest. I said this mixture is fine for your hands and it is, but it will dry them out. So after you put your hands in there, just go ahead and put on a little lotion or a tallow and that'll keep them from being uh, painful. I put my fresh pellets in first, followed by all the frozen ones. You do not need to thaw those out. Just go ahead and put them in the bucket as is. I put in probably two to two and a half gallons of water in this bucket, I'm about halfway on a five gallon bucket. Give it a good stir and then weigh it down with a rock or a brick or something like that. Once or twice a day, whenever you think of it, come through and just give it a quick stir. I use a wooden spoon for this, but it's totally fine to use your hands if you've got something like a lotion to put on your hands after you're done. You should probably keep them in this solution for full seven days. In this video, I'm doing five. I'm scraping the pelt. You'll notice that I'm gonna leave just a little bit of extra membrane stuff on the pelt. I'm just leaving the more difficult stuff on there and putting it back in the water for another two days. After you remove the majority of the like fats and meats and membrane, um, that, that brine is gonna be way more efficient on whatever is left. So it's gonna come off really fast. You could probably come back in like 12 hours and do it, but you know, one to two days is great. We, I have my scraping stand right in front of the house. Uh, that is so I can watch my kids through the window. They can watch me. They can knock on the glass if they need anything. I also have uh, the window on the front of my house by the front door cracked open so that way I can hear for them. Also, they're three and five, so they can put their boots and coats on and come outside and play in the snow around me if they want. I didn't shovel snow for this. I'm doing this on top of my septic tank because the heat rising from that is melting all of the snow off. So if I drop something, it's not hard for me to find it. And also since it's a septic tank, there's not gonna be any plants growing here. So whatever salt and alum drips down is not going to be killing any grass. If you didn't know it already, salt will kill any vegetation you have. You can use it as a natural weed killer. But if you don't want dead spots in your yard, I would advise doing it somewhere that you don't mind it dying or putting down a tarp or something like that. If you're feeling bold, you can also just do it in your house. That's okay too. I did not make this scraping stand. It was here when we bought the house. I don't know what it was for. Maybe it was for this, maybe it was for something else. But if you don't have something like this, take a log and just kind of lean it up at an angle. That'll work fine. You can also just do it on your kitchen table if you don't mind cleaning up a little bit. It's March, so I've been inside more than I would like to be this winter. I'm happy to be outside and cold. My fingers turn red during this video, but I can assure you I am completely happy out here. I'm just my common alum from Hoosier Hill Farm. It was $12 and that little container will let me do 12 pelts. 
I think I paid $4 for the salt and one of those containers should do four batches of pelts, which is 24 pelts total. So your total cost per hide is gonna be just over a dollar each. It might be a little closer to $2 if you insist on using eggs instead of brains, but it's, it's very small. Maybe it's a weird pride thing for me, but I just do not get the satisfaction out of buying something as making it myself. You can buy pre-made tanning solutions from the store, but I think that takes all the fun and all the pride out of it. Plus, you're going to be left with a pelt that smells very chemically. If you do it the more natural approach, it's going to smell a lot more natural. It's going to smell like a combination of a clean rabbit, earthiness, and a little bit of smoke. Mine is also going to smell a little bit like lavender since I'm using the deer tallow that I made last year. The smoky smell is going to come from smoking the pelt, which is what's going to make it waterproof and very long lasting, so it will last over 100 years. And that earthy scent is going to come from the brain. Brains look and smell remarkably like mushrooms, and that will be no exception with your new rabbit pelt. It might be a little bit strange when you're first starting out, but once your pelt is finished, you're really going to appreciate that. Since you'll be smoking it after you put on the brains, the brain scent won't be quite as prevalent, but it'll still be there. It's just like a really nice undertone. You can absolutely skip the smoking stage if you want to. It's just not going to be waterproof, so make sure you keep it in your house and take good care of it so it doesn't get wet. Here in the Rocky Mountains, I am really not concerned about moisture, especially since we have a wood stove as our only heat source. But if you are somewhere that's more wet or tropical, I would, I would consider making it uh, smoked so that way you don't have to worry about mold or hair slip. Hair slip is when the hairs literally just start falling out and it kind of turns this funky rotten smell. You really don't want that. I have my scraping stand right. Some people will go through and try and scrape the pelts before they do any brine or solution like I have. And while there's nothing wrong with that, it is much more difficult for it to come off and you're a lot more likely to accidentally put little holes in your pelt. If it's been in the pickling solution long enough, it'll just peel right up and you don't even need to use a knife. I prefer this because I'm a lot less likely to make any mistakes. Plus, I think it's pretty satisfying. If you are curious about dispatching and processing a rabbit humanely and without any waste, I have a video on that I put up four or five days ago now. That shows you how to put the rabbit down, take the hide off in one piece, gut the animal, remove the meat, and then put it away for storage. It is really important to me that I don't waste any parts of the animal, so I show how to use every part in these videos. If you want to watch me scrape this pelt slowly and as it actually happens, I have, I think it's a 17 minute video of me doing just that, no talking, no music, just scraping out here in the Kootenai National Forest. Also, I think this is only my seventh video in total, so I am very open to any constructive criticism you might have. This is not familiar territory for me, but I'm happy to learn and I'm enjoying the process so far. I think it's so wild that I started sharing videos on my social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook as a primary way to find new writing clients because I am a full-time writer. And then in one year, I had two clients replace me with AI, which that was frustrating, but I totally understand why. It's pretty hard for me to compete with something that is instant and free, even though it is full of errors. So now they are paying someone from another country $5 an hour to go through and rewrite whatever ChatGPT says. And of course, $5 an hour is way less than what I charge for my pieces. But anyway, I just started talking about losing my work to AI and then my social media absolutely blew up with that. And there was this huge influx of people who were interested in the homesteading side of things. And then that led to people asking me to put up YouTube videos that are much longer and more in depth, especially for the rabbits here. And now here we are. <laughs> I'm really grateful you're here and I hope I can give you what you're looking for. My husband and I moved to this property almost four years ago now. We started looking for property back in 2015 or 2016, well before we had kids when we were just newlyweds. But we couldn't find anything that met most of our needs and was within our budget for four years. We actually found a place we really liked in March of 2020 and last minute the sellers decided to keep it. We had a bunch of old timers who were farmers there in Indiana telling us not to buy at that time because in March of 2020, you know what happened. They told us the housing market was gonna tank and it would be the worst thing ever if we bought a house. But we just had this gut feeling that we could not shake that we needed to do it now or never. So for like the first time in my life, I did not listen to my elders advice and I went and uh, we bought a house here in Northwestern Montana. 
Our place is 20 acres. It's got at least four springs, two ponds, a good stream running through it. It's heavily wooded like I wanted and the house was finished like my husband wanted. And the reason why we could afford it was it sat on the market for well over a year. And I think the septic tank was inspected by the same person who put it in. So technically it didn't have a septic tank. After we bought it, we had it checked out and it turned out it was perfect, which was just wonderful. We were really nervous about that. The other reason it had sat on the market for so long was because it was on the north side of a mountain and it's about 1200 feet above the valley below. So from about Thanksgiving to the middle of January, we do not have any sunshine here in our house. We also get a lot more snow than the rest of our community for the most part, which is a downside for many people. We don't mind it. We are just thrilled to be here. We love it so much. It's about 60 miles into Kalispell, which is where Walmart and Costco are. That's about a 90 minute drive each way. It's actually closer to a two hour drive each way if it's just me by myself. I drive a lot slower in the snow. So I go grocery shopping about once a month, sometimes once every two months. All in all, I just really love it here. And soon I hope to give you guys a homestead tour. Like I said, we've been here about four years. When we first arrived, I was eight months pregnant with our second baby, a boy. We moved about 2000 miles cross country while I was very pregnant. After arriving, we had to quickly find a doctor who would be willing to do a C-section. I don't have the correct anatomy to have a natural birth. So after I had him, obviously I had some healing to do. And of course I was watching him and our 18 month old daughter at the time. My husband gathered and cut all the firewood all by himself that fall. And at that time he was still a truck driver. So after I had my baby, he went back over the road for about three months. We saw him maybe two days a month during those three months. And that was also my very first winter here. So I figured out what three feet of snow looked like. I also learned what it was like for the temperature to drop below freezing at October and then stay that way until late spring. After that, my husband switched to an office job, which I was so grateful for, where he drove 90 minutes each way to work five days a week. Obviously, he was gone a lot of hours, so a lot of this stuff was my responsibility to handle. I happily took that responsibility, but that was a lot with two little kids and no childcare. Last summer, our kids finally hit the age where things started getting easier, but at that point they were so much fun. We were struggling to actually get anything done. We just wanted to take them out and go to the fair. We also wanted to go fishing and kayaking and camping and go do all the fun things with them that we had been looking forward to ever since before we had kids. So we weren't very productive last year, even though we thought we finally would be. I don't know if it's okay to share the details yet, so I won't, but we are getting a lot more help this year. I am so, so thrilled and so grateful. Since we moved here, we built a goat barn, a chicken house, and two sets of rabbit hutches. And we started on a greenhouse, but did not finish it this winter. This year I have high hopes for cutting down timber from our property, milling it, and then using that to build us a horse barn. Also finishing that big 500 square foot greenhouse, which will work all year round, and maybe getting in my husband's dream garage. Of course you have to put up perimeter fencing too, but we have a lot to look forward to, a lot to get done, and for once we are gonna have all the help we need, and I'm just so grateful. I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you guys. I bought my rabbits from a rabbit tree in Avon, Montana. They were originally from L3 Rabbit Tree. I believe that was in Oregon or Washington State. I drove 500 miles round trip to go pick up my rabbits. She did me a huge favor. I bought Samantha off of her, which is my main doe, but she bred Samantha to Lancelot first. So that doe was already pregnant when I picked her up and then I bought a completely unrelated buck from her. So I bought two rabbits and then we came home and she had her babies. So I ended up getting 14 rabbits for basically the price of two. I kept the very best does out of that litter. I let them grow up and now this year they are going to breed for the very first time. So right now I have four does and one buck. I might go down to three does depending on the temperament of one of these. I have one who is a little bit iffy. And for they're not kind to people, I don't want to keep making more of them. We will see how she acts after she has her first kits. There are not many American chinchilla rabbits left in the U.S. anymore. The American chinchilla rabbit comes from the standard chinchilla rabbit, which came from France in 1920 as a means to replace, I think, the wild pelt trade. I think at that time it was harder to get wild pelts, probably due to overhunting and overtrapping, but I'm not completely sure of that. So these domestic rabbits were produced to replace that. And then the American chinchilla originated from the standard. Americans are considerably larger. They're about 12 pounds when fully grown. 
And there is another chinchilla variety called the giant chinchillas and they get up to 16 pounds. According to the American Livestock Conservancy, giant and American chinchillas have fewer than 200 annual registrations in the US and they have an estimated global population of less than 2,000. The standard chinchilla rabbit, which is what started them all, has fewer than 100 annual registrations in the US and an estimated global population of less than 1,000. So if you're looking for chinchilla style rabbits or any other rabbits for that matter, check out the livestockconservancy.org. Other great resources are the Farmish app, Facebook groups, Craigslist, and the ARBA.com. I do sell my rabbits when I have them available. Currently, the way things have been going, I've had more people interested than I've even had rabbits. And I'm in these rabbits because I enjoy eating the meat and keeping the pelts and using all the parts of the rabbit, so I don't want to sell out every time. I'm also trying to make sure that I give out genuinely good rabbits. I want them to have good body conformation, good temperaments, and be good mothers. My main doe is consistently having 12 babies at every litter. She is a total sweetheart, and the buck is so sweet that I actually let him stay in with the mother. He always takes good care of the kits. That is a bit rare of a trait, but I'm very happy with that. These rabbits are so sweet that they even let my little kids pick them up, which means a lot. And they grow ridiculously fast without eating a lot of food. That has a lot of meaning for meat breeders and homesteaders. Something interesting about the chinchilla rabbits is from a distance they look gray, and then when you get closer you'll think that they have black and white hairs together that make them look gray. But if you blow on the hair on their back, kind of like blowing out a birthday candle, you'll see a ring up here, and there will be four distinct bands of color. You'll see white skin in the middle, followed by a dark ring, a white ring, a dark ring, and then a very faint little white ring around the outside that is the very outside of the hair, that is the outside of the hair follicle. So it's interesting to look at, and if your rabbit is not molting, these rings are going to be very distinctive, and you're going to see a very definite beginning and end of each of these rings. I think that is absolutely fascinating, and I think it makes your crafts look so much cooler. Now, I am absolutely not ripping on other rabbit breeders, but a lot of times when people raise New Zealand's or Californians, which are white rabbits, they discard the pelt completely, which it's your animal, you can do what you like, but for me, I don't like to see any waste. And I think if you have a rabbit whose coat you really care about and you think is interesting, you're going to be more inclined to save it and do something with it, even if it's just selling it to someone who can appreciate it. There are plenty of solid colored rabbits out there that are going to give you the same color every time, so that way it's really easy to have uniform, um, cohesive projects. But if you want to keep things interesting and have lots of fun, different colored projects, I highly recommend the Rex. You can find them in solid shades and you can get predictable litters with predictable colors, but you can also get a crazy mixed bag of colors, which I think is so cool. Especially if you're breeding for color and you've got different colored rabbits mating together. I don't want to overcomplicate my breeding program, so I'm just sticking to one color and one breed and I'm happy with that. But part of me is just so excited by all the different colors that are available. And if you have the space to do it, I say do it. Now let's, now let's talk about diets and the cost to feed a rabbit. Pregnant and nursing does do not need any extra feed, but you do need to change their fiber to protein intake. A non-breeding doe needs 20 to 27% fiber, while a pregnant or nursing doe needs 15 to 20% fiber. Meanwhile, a non-breeding doe needs somewhere between 12 and 15% protein, and a pregnant and then nursing doe will need 16 to 20% protein. So instead of feeding your pregnant or nursing doe more, just alter so they're eating slightly less fiber and slightly more protein. A great protein source is alfalfa hay. Keep in mind though that your bucks shouldn't have that much alfalfa because it's not good for them. I have a full breakdown on the homesteaderschronicle.com. You can go to homesteaderschronicle.com slash how to grow rabbit feed and I have all of the nerdy stuff right there for you. But I'll share the most important highlights with you right here. Our adult American chinchillas eat about 18 pounds of forage every month. That could be grass, hay, all of your leafy vegetables, that's what forage is. The basic rule is a rabbit will eat 1.5 times their body weight each month. Not 100% of that goes into their bodies. They are gonna waste some of it by using it as bedding or just not eating it, but I believe that 1.5 is better than just feeding them their body weight in forage every month. The wasted hay goes into the floor of my chicken coop for a few days before it goes into the compost pile, so it's really never wasted. So a buck and three does will eat about 72 pounds of forage each month. Their offspring will eat little to no forage during the first four weeks of life because they are nursing. And then during the four to eight week mark, they will each eat up to 10 pounds. This is estimated very high just for security. My rabbit has 12 kits every time, but for this example, we're just gonna say six because that's more reasonable for a lot of breeders. 
So for three does, you're gonna have 18 kits, assuming they each have six babies. These babies will eat up to 180 pounds during their second month of life, while the parents will eat 72 pounds for a total of 252 pounds of forage. You can butcher them at eight weeks old. This is not my preference, but some people do it. Each baby will weigh five to eight pounds, giving you two to three pounds of meat, and you will turn 180 pounds of hay into about 50 pounds of meat. Eating the rabbits at this time is the most optimized time for feed to meat conversion, which is a three, it is a 3.6 to one ratio. You can get that ratio closer to three to one if you are willing to add in some grains to their diet. If you keep the rabbits another month, they will eat another 12 pounds of hay each for a total of 396 pounds of hay since their birth. And these rabbits will be up to 10 to 12 pounds each, giving you four to six pounds of meat. So those three litters will give you around 90 pounds of meat. If you keep the young meat rabbits until they are four months old, they will eat up to 18 pounds, totaling 720 pounds of hay for a total of 108 pounds of meat. It's at this point that you can keep the pelts because their hides will be more developed enough to not tear during the tanning process. It costs just over a dollar to tan each hide if you use the method I'm showing you today, and each tan pelt is worth $20 to $25 each. And I will say that the reward of tanning these hides and using them for whatever project you like is priceless. So if you eat these rabbits at the most optimal time, which is when you're gonna get about 50 pounds of meat from those three litters, you will need 150 pounds of hay. Most small squares of hay are 50 pounds. If you live in the Midwest or the South, you might be able to get those for $4, which means you just got 50 pounds of meat for $12. If you live somewhere where the hay is more expensive, you're gonna be looking at closer to $51 for those 50 pounds of meat. If you have a buck and three does and you let each- So how much food for the year? So for a buck and three does to have three litters each, which is nine litters total for the year on a forage only diet, and assuming that you let each of these kits grow out to be four months old before butchering them so that way you get to have the pelts, you will need about 3,000 pounds of hay for all the rabbits all year long. It takes about two or three round bales to make up that 3,000 pounds of hay. In the Midwest and South, you might be able to get it for as low as $30 a round bale, which is somewhere between $60 and $90 for your- That $60 to $90 will get you around 324 pounds of meat. Here in Montana, I have seen the round bales go for as much as $300 a bale. Thankfully, right now, it looks like I could get about 3,000 pounds of hay for somewhere around $300. Nine litters of six rabbits will get you about 54 pelts for the year, too. And don't forget, you can sell each of the feet for like keychains, which is about $10 a piece. And I've seen rabbit ears go for about $5 for the pair as dog treats. So it is possible for you to make your money back if you're willing to put in the work. Okay, let's extract the brain from the rabbit skull so we can continue on with our tanning process. I actually could not find a single video online on how to do this. I even watched a bunch of university dissection videos and they never showed how to do it. So this is something that my husband and I came up with and it seems to work pretty well. And he's actually gonna be the one to do it because he's got much stronger hands than I do and I completely forgot to take these rabbit heads out of the freezer. So they are frozen completely solid. I have heard you can use a big metal spoon and just kind of whack them on the back of the head and it'll pop open for you. But I know that would absolutely not work with how frozen solid these are. The ears actually go straight down to the brain, so kind of look in there to see what the angle is, and then position your saw somewhere between the eyes and the ears. While I edit and upload this video that you're watching right now, those brains will continue to thaw out, and then I will put them right onto the hides and have the next video up very soon. So feel free to start your tanning process, and I will have this finished before you get to day five.